Thank you, Normand. Um, and nice to be here again at BAFT uh, to give a bit of insight on uh, digital trade finance. Um, for those who don't know me, Global Product Manager at JP Morgan, covering uh, core trade, digital innovation and solutions, and also have a vice chair position on the current ICC Banking Commission, where I sponsor the commercialization working group looking at driving adoption of the EUCP and the EURC and the recently released URDTT. So if we can go to the next slide, just some of the talking points which I'd like to cover uh, today. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be as funny as uh, the previous uh, coffee session, unfortunately. This won't be dry. Hopefully, it'll be informative uh, for you all. and. Um, give you some ideas on what to look forward to. So we'll start with the first one, which is the recent announcement by SDOCS. Uh, this was a press release dated July 27th, where they um, mentioned that they carried out the first electronic bill of lading, which incorporated a lot of the long awaited legal reform uh, that would support the MLETR, the Model Law for Electronic Transferable Records, um, in Singapore, this is the Electronic Transactions Act. Um, the question I have, why does it take a year, right, to start using some of this legal reform that we're long uh, waiting for? And the industry has already taken an, other steps forward. Uh, BAF's own Todd uh, Burwell is a sitting member on the ICC Digital Standards Initiative Legal Reform Advisory Board. This is a separate work, uh, working group uh, where cross-regional and cross-industry members have one primary goal, and that is to scale up legal reform across the globe, right? Again, because trade is generally um, cross-border, uh, so then we need the legal reforms in various jurisdictions uh, you know, to be up to date. For those who are not familiar with the uh, ICC DSI, this is again another uh, initiative out of the International Chamber of Commerce where senior representatives of various organizations uh, such as banks, standard issuing bodies, corporates, um, and other key uh, industry associations collaborate together to harmonize the trade environment addressing the challenges that we're all facing today. We're all trying to bridge the digital gap. We're all trying to adopt and look for interoperable solutions. And this is what the key focus is of the uh, DSI. For those who would like to know more about the DSI or the LRAB, um, please do visit the DSI um, website, right? So just Google uh, ICC and DSI and you should be given a link and there's a lot of um, useful information. Uh, for you there. So one of the focuses, you know, again, on the legal reform is a driving adoption of the MLETR um, because the key um, items which one focuses on when talking about electronic records is we need to ensure originality, right? How do you ensure that this is an original version of an electronic record? One has to be able to possess it. Right? How do I prove ownership that I possess this intangible object right, that could sit on the blockchain or it could sit in another digital um, uh, format? We also need to ensure that it's transferable and most importantly, from a bank's perspective, negotiable. So we've seen uh, legal reform in various uh, jurisdictions, a lot of uh, consultancy uh, efforts uh, being uh, put forward. Here in the US, the UCC uh, has put forward Article 12 of the Controllable Electronic Records. This has been over three years of work uh, by the American Law Institute and the Uniform Law Commission, sponsored by the UCC, in addressing technological advances that would affect the paper that we deal with today drafts, negotiable instruments, promissory notes, and electronic documents of title and more. So now I'm gonna just, for those who are not familiar with this, uh, these changes and the amendments to the UCC, 
the definition of a controllable electronic record um, is a record of information in electronic form that is susceptible to control. For one to have control, one must have the power to enjoy, sustain substantially all the benefits of the CER. And the CER is the acronym. Of course, we love our acronyms. The exclusive power to prevent another from enjoying substantially all the benefit of the CER and the exclusive power to transfer control or to cause another person to obtain control of the CER. One must also be readily um, able to identify oneself to a third party as having powers or having um, ownership of it. And this could be through a cryptographic key or an account number. So these changes and other amendments to the UCC have been uh, ratified uh, by uh, the, was it, um, the Uniform Law Commission. They are now being presented at individual state levels. I believe New Hampshire was one of the first ones to actually uh, put this bill forward uh, for later this year. But I think all of us are we have our, key, our eyes on New York. So hopefully in the coming uh, months and early next year, we'll see more, some advances there and changes to this New York state uh, law. A bit of updates from other um, geographies, English law. Unfortunately, I uh, hit a bit of a stumbling block with the political uh, upheaval in England. Um, this has delayed uh, the passing of the bill uh, that was presented by Prince Charles on behalf of uh, the Queen earlier the, uh, this year. Uh, the expectations at the moment are that this bill will be passed uh, mid-2023. Again, it's not just the passing of the bill that we're waiting for, but it's also getting up and ready and implement this change so we can drive adoption of these new digital uh, tools. Elsewhere, there's been progress, notable, notable progress in France. Uh, the Netherlands is looking at the uh, bill of lading uh, at the moment. And Germany has adopted a three-prong approach whereby the one focusing on the bill of lading, two is on the transport insurance certificate, and the last one is the bill of exchange and prom note. Everything seems to be moving in the right direction. Again, a bit like the UK, uh, second half of 2023 um, is the uh, proposed um, date at the moment in Germany, except for the bill of exchange and prom note, which might take some more time. And the reason for this is that Germany ratified the 1930 Geneva Treaty for the unification of laws on bills of exchange. And this is something that the UK and the US did not do. So any country that has you know, uh, joined this treaty, um, there may be a bit more uh, delay, um, but at least there's noticeable progress uh, on that front. All right, enough of the legal talk because I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so we'll go on to the standards. Um, this is something again also, yeah, Dear to my heart, as we all know that uh, standards are a great enabler uh, for the digitization of trade. And this was one of, again, another of the thoughts behind the uh, Digital Standards Initiative from the ICC. There have been notable developments in the terms of standardizing the electronic bill of lading uh, with the likes of DCSA and FIATA, who are now part of the DSI advisory board so these are, you know, the standard bills of lading are coming up. They're there, ready to be used um, in the near future. And we've seen the emergence of certain fintech companies watching these developments very closely to ensure that they're up and capable of supporting these new standards and the standard electronic bill of lading, whether it be a, a bulk a commodity shipment or it's containerized and so forth. Because the last time I think we checked, less than 2% of all bills of lading issued last year were electronic. And for those who were at the BAFT conference in December in Houston, heard from you know, the head of the Houston Port Authority himself mentioned that he's ready and able. The only problem is that he still gets paper bills of lading presented every time there's a shipment. So I ask you, 
Are you ready for the electronic bill of lading? What, have you considered what your policies and procedures uh, say with regard to the use of electronic bills of lading, uh, whether it's issuing an LC or advising, confirming an LC? What about if you're asked to support an electronic bill of lading as part of a documentary collection? How are you gonna satisfy your sanction screening? Are you prepared to finance off of uh, an intangible bill of lading when your policy states that you need to use it as collateral? These are just some of the thoughts that you know, banks should start looking into as the industry starts to drive and move to commercialize the use of the electronic bill of lading more and more and get yourself ready to support these um, in the near future. Another standard which has sparked a lot of debate and interest is the legal entity identifier. The Reserve Bank of India has mandated that banks processing domestic payments in excess of the equivalent of $5 million, right, capture and validate the LEI for both parties. Are your systems capable of doing this? Do you have the LEI for your clients? How do you obtain an LEI for your clients? The threshold right now is $5 million in India, right? However, yeah, all indications seem to suggest that this threshold is going to be reduced very uh, soon in the near future, right? And this could be down to all domestic payments and eventually to all cross-border payments at some point in time. The Reserve Bank of India is not the only regulator that is actually looking at this. There was uh, indications in previous uh, announcements from the Bank of England. You know, there were other uh, parties as well that are looking at the use of LEI. Here in the US, the Customs and Border Patrol Agency is actually running a pilot using the LEI to identify who the suppliers are. They're doing this on the import flows. Right, they're testing this uh, data point along with two others right, to see, is it of value and can we actually identify who, uh, where these shipments are coming from? But again, you know, I noted in my article in the GTR uh, earlier this year, don't wait for the regulator to come and mandate the LEI as the Reserve Bank of India did, because then it's a mad scramble to ensure that you've got the data point, you have to get all of these exceptions. If you don't have the LEI, what do you do you know, if you don't have it? Are you gonna stop the payment or do you just proceed? Right? These are all questions that one needs to ask themselves uh, when looking at these uh, standards. And I think also for me, the LEI, the regulator may want it, but I think there's a lot of benefit within trade itself in using LEI. Think of all the client static records, all the data you have to set up in your systems, right? Clients bank with multiple banks, right? If we all had the same client ID number, wouldn't it be great, right? All use the same data source, right? To ensure that you've got the right name, you've got the right domicile and so forth. This is some of the benefits that LEI could bring to you. Think also internally about your internal data analytics uh, processes. How much time is spent on trying to map clients and you know, parent to child entities on the organizational hierarchy in terms of credit exposure and or um, outstandings or any payments, whatever the data uh, reporting requirements are, right? Wherever you've got client information, you want to find an easy way to consolidate that. Also look at LEI in terms of KYC, AML validating that, that you have the right information, right, um, to hand. It is a third party uh, data source, which has been vetted and so forth. So again, you know, if you'd like to know more on LEI, please reach out to myself. There's also the Glyph organization uh, who have members here um, in the US and happy to uh, um, engage anyone on the use of LEI. Sticking on uh, standards, 
Right. I think another thing worth noting, and apologies are going back to the IECC, but they released uh, in conjunction with the World Trade Organization, a very handy tool uh, or a toolkit, they call it, which is free of charge. So go to the ICC DSI website. Yeah, you can download a copy of the standards toolkit for cross-border paperless trade. This is a document that houses existing standards that one can use. Many of these you'll probably use today already, but it also highlights and addresses significant developments you know, uh, that could be of benefit to you, your organization, and so forth as you look to uh, go down the digital transformation uh, road. The last thing I wanted to mention about standards, you know, is goes back to my earlier comment on the SDOCs and the electronic bill of lading. And why does it take so long? Don't let it take so long. Don't be too late to start. Start your own journey today, right? Um, there should be, and this is, again, this is my opinion, there should be a concerted focus on the implementation, the adoption, and the commercialization of legal reform across the globe, as well as the adoption of standards. It isn't down, only down to the industry bodies to do this, but we as banks need to collaborate together, right, to run proof of concepts. Don't sit back and wait for banks like JP Morgan or other larger banks you know, to try and test this out. If you're interested and you want to do this, reach out and see, you know, run some POCs. Yeah, it's not that hard. Uh, play, as I say, get your bucket and spade, go into the sandbox and uh, play around and see if, see if these things work. All right, then um, going on to the next topic, um, going beyond the client to bank journey. This is relatively new stuff, although it's a bit old um, towards a bit. So we've all heard of the Dear CEO letter. We're all aware of the increased pressure that our trade operation staff members are facing today and that they have to do more transactional due diligence trade-based money laundering checks, red flags, vessel container screening, you name it. From the days I spent in operations, you know, doing uh, doc examination, none of this was there, right? It was just compare the LC to the documents received and process the payment. So there's a lot of pressure on our op staff today. However, there's also a heightened Client expectations. Clients expect you to turn things around a lot faster. And it has to be cheaper. With the increased amount of due diligence that we need to do either as part of the LC issuance, the doc examination process, and so forth, right? This is impacting, as I mentioned, operations. They have to adopt additional manual processes, right? to support the, uh, the transactions. They have to do uh, re-enter data multiple times into various websites. Um, you may not have access to a vessel screening or sanction screening tool, or do you know how to, can checking out the container uh, number, dual purpose goods, the fair price check on uh, goods and so forth. All of the, these types of checks, right? You may need access to an external website data source, which is expensive. And your ops staff, when they do this, when they go through these checks, they need to record their findings. This will be important because you need to ensure a correct audit trail for the decision-making process. So wouldn't it be great if you could digitize this? What if you could extract all the data from the documents or out of the data files that you are receiving, right? And use this data, right? And then validate this, share this with other data providers in the seamless process. But I, another thing which I did mention to the ICC is we need guidance. We need some standards when it comes to trade-based money laundering. It's fine that the regulators 
impose this on us and we will do this to ensure that we you know uh, abide by these regulations but what is what's your interpretation of these rules versus ours or that of another bank right so i suggested to the banking commission that we start looking uh, to create some form of guidance maybe standards around what does it mean to do a vessel check what are you actually checking what about containers? What is dual purpose goods? You know, what, what are you checking for, right? And what are the standards around this? Because we all need to do this. So with the benefits of OCR, you know, and natural language processing and other innovative technologies, there have been an emergence of fintechs looking to help streamline this very onerous process. Extract the data, capture it in a data file, and then process the payment that would help support your ops SMEs in their due diligence of each transaction. There's some out there today, um, you know, uh, which are interesting, interesting developments that we've seen. Um, because yeah, one th we want to make sure that no one gets onto the front page for the wrong reasons, right? All right, then. Um, Sticking on the topic of, uh, of fraud and due diligence, uh, a few years ago, the trade finance industry was rocked with claims of fraud. You call it duplicate financing, double calling on LCs, call it what you will. So we've seen an emergence of validation agents. These are fintech solutions where banks can provide data be it extracted from the invoice, the bill of lading, warehouse receipt, and other documents. And you submit the, this data, it's hashed, you submit it into this pool of data, and you get a response whether another bank has financed it or seen similar data uh, attributes, right? And that would maybe cause, raise a question, do you want to finance this transaction or not? So these validation agents have appeared um, in the industry, um, in my opinion, in theory, it's a great tool. However, I have one concern. If I'm going to have access to one tool and you put your data in another repository, a different one, how am I going to know, right? So we're still trying to solve for the interoperability of the electronic bill of lading or the electronic digital negotiable instruments. Are we recreating the wheel here? Or should I say, creating yet another digital island, which we're all actually trying to um, make sure that they coexist and that it's interoperable. Just some thoughts on that one. Then the last thing what I'll uh, address and then I'll see if there are any uh, questions. Um, back in June 2021, the ICC uh, released a brief on the automation of doc examination under documentary credits. And it was nice listening into the previous session on some of the discrepancies and the crazy discrepancies that were cited. But you know, if you have a tool that automates the doc examination, is this a relief to you? because banks need to look and assess their five-year plan. There are challenges today out there. We face it, everyone faces it, in finding skilled resources that would like to learn the LC or doc examination uh, processes. Today, you know, new kids in town are all focusing on working capital solutions, supply chain finance, inventory finance, no one wants to check documents anymore, right? That's old school. We don't do that anymore. So there are a number of fintechs, again, in this space that are at different stages of development. My recommendation to you all is to ask around. See if any of your peers have assessed, done a proof of concept with any of these, right? What are their thoughts? Maybe they're willing, hopefully they're willing to share some insights and their results. The only thing I say is be mindful that one's level of doc examination is very different to another, right? So when you're assessing these vendors, 
See how agile are they? Are they willing to listen and adopt and incorporate some of your own requirements yeah, for your own organization? I'm an old school doc checker. I'm very skeptical of, uh, or I was initially, of this type of technology, right? What's better than four eyes and two humans checking a set of documents? But I think there could be tangible benefits to the broader industry, right? By having an automated doc check solution. Imagine if the ICC could provide a utility of sorts where you could submit documents, right? And have it compared to the UCP and the ISP and all of the rules that the ICC has put forward and then deliver results to both banks. What a benefit this would be to us all. All right, so um, I did have another slide, but these are just more food for thought, um, no need to. And that's just thoughts on, you know, is venture capital drying up when it comes to FinTech? Is blockchain dead? But I think we're um, running out of time. I'm spot on two o'clock. So, um, all right, there are a couple of questions. Is there anyone in the industry currently ad adopted the automation of doc examination and provides expected outputs? Um, again, I, I, we can share some uh, offline. There was an article, a publication for one large uh, global bank uh, that had announced an, a partnership with uh, one of these vendors. If you have contacts with them, um, you know, otherwise reach out to me, maybe I can uh, help and connect you with someone with that organization uh, as well. So feel free to drop me an email, um, ask any questions um, on LEI or doc examination or, and so forth. But uh, I think with this, I'll hand it back to Norma.